Oh. All right. So here we are. InfoSec decoded number 26, five stars, starting with Irvin, who has something that Mexico is doing. Yes, Mexico has signed into law a, a piece of legislation that if you want to get a SIM card, you have to give up some biometric data. Uh, this will now be the 18th country, including China, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, UAE, who mandates you have to have biometric data collected uh, for people to use their mobile phone. Yay. So that, does that mean nobody has like these disposable pay-as-you-go phones there? That's basically what the trend there. I mean, their reason is to, to try to knock out organized crime and anybody who's trying to, you know, send stuff through their phones so everybody can find them. But, uh, you know, this is going to backfire somehow. Like, the database is probably not going to be secure. Yeah. You just get exposed to the world and, yay, more, uh, more biometric data out and about. Especially in Mexico, where I understand the government is completely corrupt and Criminal gangs can easily get any data the government has and stuff. Yep. Yeah, that sounds uh, on brand. Yeah. Very much so. And Caitlin has the awesome one, the fake Amazon reviewers. I do. So um, uh, Info Security Group, um, Info Information Security Magazine, has this wonderful article about a misconfigured database. And uh, some people pulled the data off the database and it turned out this database was a big collection of, of people creating fake reviews for like Amazon products. Uh, so there was like seven gigabytes worth of data extracted from like 13 million records. And they included like emails, WhatsApp, telephone numbers, uh, you know, vendor contracts, uh, uh, contacts, you know, PayPal account details, et cetera. And they were used in the creation of, of fake review scams where people would pay money to say like, we need a, like a five-star review on our products. And they would, you know, and they, they had, um, you know, all, all the details there for everyone to see. So that was, that's good, clean fun. Yeah, they haven't published the results. So I would like to see a list of which reviews are fake or something. I'm sure there's a ton, oh, like, yeah. uh, especially with, if you go onto Amazon and you look, and a lot of the products are like not from name brands, they're from, you know, just, uh, it, like rebranded Chinese um, yeah. stock, you know? I don't know how you would call it, but um, I'm sure like the vast majority of those comments are just absolutely fake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've always thought so. All right, and then Alan's got, uh, oh yeah, the, the opt-in rate for ads. Alan, you're too quiet, can't hear you. You're still too quiet. Maybe he vanished. How about now? That's better. Oh, there he is. Okay, good. All right. So it's a very dull title, but this is really very consequential news because Flurry Analytics is tracking uh, iPhone, iOS users' behavior after the 14.5 iOS update, which allows people to opt out of tracking on all the apps that are installed on their phone. Actually, I should say opt in because by default, all users uh, automatically um, are opted out of tracking on the apps. So this is a very big deal to Facebook, of course, because all of its apps are monetized by advertising, of course, and their whole business model is tracking anything and everything that people do on the internet. And if Facebook is no longer able to do that, then their advertising platform is suddenly a lot less attractive to advertisers because, well, advertisers want to know everything about their targets. Yep. And as it turns out, according to Flurry Analytics, which is a part of Verizon, I believe, the opt-in rate, or that is to say people who are allowing uh, apps to track their activity. So your infection is making helicopter noises again. Oh dear. Uh, there, Sorry, that's, folks. That's better. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the the uh, number of people who are opting in 
and permitting apps to track them online is extremely low. It's significantly lower than analysts had predicted. It's so low, in fact, that in the US, only as of today, 5% of users have opted in to this tracking. And uh, globally, it's only 13%. So that means that suddenly on the iOS platform, uh, just a tiny fraction of the total number of users are now trackable to Facebook and other uh, what one might call invasive advertisers. And yep. uh, now, of course, uh, I, the iPhone has a much smaller market share than the Android globally. But you have to wonder if Google is going to pick up on this eventually and what the consequences of that might be for some of these uh, invasive advertisers. Yeah, now I heard an analyst that said this is going to benefit Facebook because they have other ways to track you because you're probably using a Facebook app and it's other small companies that don't have an alternative. Ah, but, so the, there's less competition. That's right, this will hurt the small oh, companies more who have nothing okay. to use except the built-in tracking, but we'll see. This is how the companies battle with each other. Uh huh. Well, Facebook is no fan of this policy. They did take out a number of big ads and they've been very critical of Apple. So I'm sure this is not good news for them, but I hadn't thought of that competition angle. That, that's, yeah, if it got rid of their competitors, I suppose it might not be so bad for them after all. Well, yeah, but I mean, they will have to spend a lot of money retooling their ad infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway, we'll see what comes of it all. This is the, the dirty secret of the internet is all this tracking. Yeah, but, you know, I think that for a while it looked like the government was going to do something. Now I'm less sure. We'll see. Anyway, then down here, I've got, oh, this one I thought was awesome from the Washington Post explaining how this whole election fraud thing started in much more detail than I've ever seen before. And there's this company in 2018 and what they just this, this um this company, Russell Ramsland, had secret meetings in an airplane hangar where people had to leave their phone out because they said they were being spied on, where they presented their evidence. And their evidence is something very familiar to me. They went and got the error logs from voting machines. And of course, they saw a lot of log entries and they decided that meant they were being hacked, which makes is hilarious to me because if you're in this business, this is what students always come to you with. I must get this every couple of weeks. A student put on something like Little Snitch, or they looked in their router logs, or they looked in their operating system logs, and they said, I'm being hacked. There's all these scary log entries, because there always are. And uh, all this is why they believe they're sure it's true. And I've had people actually come to me who have like changed their lives. They're hiding from these stalkers. They're being hunted everywhere. And they bring in this pages of evidence, which is like logs. And I say, these are completely ordinary log entries. It doesn't mean the, the evil Russians are hacking you and stalking you like you think it does. You don't need to like hide under the bed and move to another house. And I can't convince them. They're convinced they understand these logs. It's like uh, astrology or something. They mean these baffling numbers and they say, I looked up that number and that means the Chinese are after me. So I, it, it helps me understand the current situation where these, the, the right wing is so completely sure that there's this evidence and why won't we admit it? You must be in on the plot. And all the experts are like, there is no evidence. Anyway, you have something to say, Liz? You look like... <laughs> I'm just agreeing because that's happened to me so many times as people are, come to me with this evidence of being hacked. And, yep. it's and you know, one of the common errors in the voting machine is vote reverse. They say, see, it says right there, they reversed the vote to change it from Trump to Biden. But what that means is the card was upside down. That's what vote reverse means. You have to pull out the card and turn it over. <laughs> So essentially this, this in, inept company uh, basically did what our beginner level students did yeah. and, and saw what they thought was an indicator of compromise that totally wasn't and then told, but, but went ahead and told everybody that it was anyway. Well, that, you know, if you're generally distrustful, and of course it all starts by having somebody who feels like they should have won the election. Like Trump, they go to a rally, there's all these people cheering. They look at the other side, there's not as very many people cheering. They say, obviously we will win. They must have tricked us. And right. so with that attitude, then you look in the logs and you will totally find confirmation. Yeah, and I was just gonna say confirmation bias is a uh, hell of a drug. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a, a fun in-depth analysis by the Washington Post there. And uh, Liz has got information. I like how the Washington Post. Yeah. 
I like how the Washington Post tracked down uh, a number of political candidates that this Ramsland had approached previously yeah. in trying to get some uh, sucker to believe in this, this whole uh, vote machine hacking conspiracy theory. And uh, nobody was willing to buy on to it until, of course, Trump lost the election. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing about Trump right from the start is he's jumping on any conspiracy theory that's handy, like Obama wasn't born here and stuff. He's totally the guy that would be the poster child for this stuff. Most candidates are not crazy enough to do that, except now. Now everybody's imitating him, like Tucker Carlson jumping on every vaccine myth. He's changed the uh, political standards. It used to be that you can't be like openly insane while running for office. That would be a bad thing, but now it's a good thing. Anyway, Liz has got some. It works. Home. It, it does gets votes. To, it does seem to work. I would like to hope it won't work for long, but I might appear to be wrong. Every off ramp is being jumped. I'm beginning to think we're stuck with this until Trump dies. I mean, nothing will ever make his followers stop following him, apparently. But you know, I just don't understand it. It's it'll go out of fashion at some point. For some reason, it will not make any sense to me. I hope so, but I mean, the thing is, is even if even when Trump dies, you've still got people like Tucker Carlson eagle, eager to eager to lead that angry mob of folks who want to believe all that stuff. That's why I think Tucker Carlson is the real heir apparent. I think none of the others have got this uh, emotional appeal. But Tucker Carlson really has people that believe everything he says, no matter how stupid it is, which is also Trump's magic power. So right. I think I think starting on TV is going to be the big new uh, winning. Anyway, hopefully it'll stop some point, but I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Anyway, uh, Liz has got something about Hong Kong. Yeah, so I thought this was kind of an interesting little article that I stumbled across in the register uh, about um, how students, um, college students uh, are kind of Re reluctant to reticent to uh, undertake uh, careers in cybersecurity because they're afraid that it might make them a target. And um, you know, I've actually heard this from a student or two in the U.S. as well, where um, you, usually those students are worried about uh, immigration issues um and so they're scared to do anything that might make them a target and and i think there's probably less of a less of an issue with that here but i don't know um and, and this was so this was uh this this the the um information in this article um came largely from a security professional who, who worked in Hong Kong for the last couple of years. And she also taught as an adjunct um, at a university, uh, at Hong Kong University during that time. And so she talked to a lot of students and um, especially during that time, you know, with all of the 2019-2020 uh, when all of the um, government and protest stuff was going on over there. Um, was a pretty strange atmosphere, I guess, and a lot of students um, really were really scared that if they played CTFs or participated in hackathons, um, the new uh, draconian levels of ISP monitoring would uh, make them a target for increased government surveillance or get them into trouble. And I, I can understand that, but it's also a major problem for Hong Kong and China because you really don't want to be discouraging your bright young minds from uh, studying and becoming good at cybersecurity because that's going to position you pretty poorly to uh, have, a, have a robust systems in your country. Yeah, yeah. It's a natural consequence of their extreme crackdown on things. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, the article doesn't talk about this, but I've always often wondered, too, uh, at the larger implications of uh, locking down the internet as, as hard as it is there now. I mean, folks will always find a way around um, uh, mechanisms that are designed to prevent them from accessing the internet, but at the same time, it's like, you know, how much 
valuable stuff is being filtered out uh, and away from folks who might be really good at this stuff. Yeah, well, this is a general thing. I've been thinking a lot because of COVID. Uh, the, the highly authoritative governments have a, a lot more enforced compliance so they can do things like have a lockdown and stop the virus. Whereas the free societies like America can't do that, but we have a lot more creativity because yeah. people can do what they love without the right. fear of government intruding on them, really. But on the flip side here, what we have is, uh, you know, poor, a lot of the time, very poor treatment of researchers who find um, security vulnerabilities and, and try to uh, ethically report those. And we also have a real digital divide problem here where um, yeah, okay, we may not lock down the internet with every restriction we can come up with, but we sure do have a lot of folks and a lot of students who can't access the internet at all at home or don't have a computer or tablet or the means to get on there. So in a way, we're creating a similar problem through different mechanisms. Yeah, I know there's even some people on this podcast with like poor internet connections that cut out and stuff. Oh, crazy, right? Yeah almost as if the uh, uh, infrastructure is really messed up here and our uh, telecoms and ISPs have no real incentive to fix it. And it's almost like they just took a bunch of money from the government to make sure that folks could get on the internet and then didn't deliver on their promises. <laughs> so, so basically you're a communist. I guess so, I must be. Yeah, it must Gasp. be. Gasp, uh, gasp. Anyway, Irvin has got something about Twitter. Something about Twitter, yes. So Twitter did this new thing, the tip jar, and uh, it so connects with- People are gonna pay you for a tweet? I've never had this happen. <laughs> I mean, that'd happen. be nice, but no. <laughs> so when they, uh, it's connected to PayPal. So when you send, when somebody sends you money, which yeah, that's quite a surprise. It does, you know, PayPal will show the address that you have or email address that you have on file. Well, you know, this happened to me. I ordered the, the New Yorker and then it never came. And then I complained to them and they said, to verify your identity, I'm going to check your address. And I said, well, I never gave you my address. They said, well, we got your address from PayPal. This is apparently what PayPal does all the time. Yes, yeah, so uh, not to no one's surprise who has used PayPal before, it gives you that information. But for those who I guess never have done that before, this was this was news that hey, if you want to tip somebody through Twitter, it goes to PayPal, and now you can see their information. But why would you tip anybody? You're going to tip people who like retweet your tweet or something? Who knows? Well, you know, I, I would I would tip people who give my products good reviews. I know I'm thinking, you know, if you bought something like Dogecoin, then you could tip anybody that says a good thing about Dogecoin, which will make the price go up. It would be a, a form of informal pump and dump. Who knows? But yeah, that's that's a thing. And and there it is. <laughs> and that was the whole point of PayPal is you don't trust the people you're dealing with. So you don't want to give them your credit card number. And then they give you their address. Yeah. That's rude. She's got a point about that. All right. And so Caitlin's got the big story, this U.S. pipeline. Man, this yeah. is growing and growing. More and more news every day about it. Yeah, and so yeah, so the Garden, the Guardian has a, has the story about a um, cyber attack that forced down one of the U.S.'s largest pipelines. Um, it's what was it? It was the Colonial Pipeline, I believe, um, and that just shut down like over five thousand miles of it because it uh, got ransomware. Um, and it's not. The, the offenders, uh, the perpetrators of this act, as far as I know at this time, is, is not known. Uh, since it's just ransomware, I assume it's a criminal gang who just got access to these systems and are just trying to make a quick buck. Um, but that is not good, obviously. <laughs> we can't have our critical infrastructure being attacked by criminals uh, for monies. Um, and so, yeah, I believe I read today another article, and I don't have it uh, up, but I believe the... Uh, Biden administration um, is commenting on this and and attempting to to weigh in on protecting our our infrastructure from hackers. Well, they're expected to have an executive order, special rules just for ransomware protection, which I'd like yeah. to see. And 
the criminal gang dark side, which is supposedly Russians, have issued a statement saying sort of they're sorry and they won't do it again and please don't hurt us. <laughs> so it, it was the Russians, you know? No, they point? say they're not Russians, but of course oh. that's what they always say. And oh. the, you can tell from their history, they don't attack targets in Russia. And that's the sign of the Russians. But it, it, whoever it is, they are claiming like they always do not to be Russians and not to be the Russian government, which probably means they are. But anyway, mm -hmm. they, um, whoever they are, they really didn't intend to irritate the entire US military and get the punishment that's coming to them. They appear to be uh, running scared now. Well, hopefully they'll, they'll be running scared and decrypt the computers. Well, yeah, that would be nice. Although they say they're recovering. So the new, latest news I heard said they probably already paid the ransom. <laughs> See, this is the problem. Like, <coughs> as long as we keep paying ransoms, we're going to keep having these issues. It is the classic uh, tragedy of the commons. Each individual person, their path to greatest advantage is to pay the ransom. But en masse, it makes it worse. Mm -hmm. This is like it's more convenient for you to just dump your toxic waste in the water. <laughs> and and there's nobody has found a way to fix that yet but there will be some kind of official government uh, statement coming out soon from the Biden administration, how to stop ransomware. I'm very interested. I would like to teach my students how to stop ransomware, but none of the instructions I've found really make much sense. They all say the same old stuff, segment your network, change the default passwords, put on your patches. And I say, okay, but you know, I'm, I was hoping there'd be something more directly targeting this problem. Anyway, uh, Alan's got the Chinese buying antivirus products. Yes, there's a great article from the Insect Group of Recorded Future that apparently they did a lot of high quality OSINT work and have determined that um, a unit, unit 61419 of the People's Liberation Army of China has been busy purchasing antivirus products, um, international antivirus products. And it's a very long list of uh, over a dozen different products out there all in the English language, not in the Chinese language. So it's very clear that this uh, unit is not interested in testing the feasibility of these products for use on internal systems, but rather they're trying to figure out how to exploit them. Now, this is not news in that other intelligence groups, military groups have actively exploited antivirus products in the past. The US has done it, uh, Israel has done it, uh, I'm sure China's done it in the past too. Yeah. But what is interesting is that the insect insect group uh, found out all this information through a Chinese military procurement website. And I assume this was on the public internet. And there's some very specific information about uh, 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 this procurement and even a contact name and contact address. And so they go into greater detail about this unit 61419, which happens to be located in a hotel uh, in a rather large complex that is supposedly a hotel um, and with some uh, uh, contact information for a certain Mr. Yu. And um, it's a nice analysis. It's a really well done analysis. The, the attack itself is perhaps not particularly revelatory, but all the OSINT work that went into this report is quite impressive. I've been hearing this for more than 10 years that the Chinese have incredibly bad OSINT. They hack you and you'll find the IP addresses are right from like the university as part of the military right in the capital city and everything. They don't hide their tracks at all. They, they do well, a lot of- What's that. anybody gonna do to them? Well, I guess so. I mean, they, then, then of course, when you complain, they officially say, oh, no, we didn't do that. You're just lying. So it's a, it's a curious arrangement. And it seems to be and, continuing. And, and to the unit 61419's credit, it's not the most obvious. Like, Insect grew a very good job with their OSINT. Uh, they even referenced a report on a electricity ash. Uh, in order to find out more information about the 61419 unit. Okay. So it's not all of, uh, you know, the most egregious, most obvious, poor OPSEC. Um, but nevertheless, that they were able to find anything is, is, uh, is a problem. And the PLA yeah, should be tidier. Uh, this is the TIC group. Yeah, I've come across them before. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to have the OSINT. 
Yeah. All right. And uh, this one I thought was great fun. So an attacker has been attacking Tor by adding extra nodes. Apparently there are only 1500 genuine Tor nodes. And this attacker will volunteer and add more nodes to the tune of adding a thousand extra nodes to the service to where something like 30% of all the Tor exit nodes are under the control of this attacker. Then they will run SSL strip on the nodes so they can intercept cryptocurrency transactions and steal the money. And this has been going on over the past year. They keep adding more nodes in until they start stealing a lot of money. Then the Tor people figure out and kick them off. Then they sneak them back in again and it goes back and forth. And this is, uh, this is like a 51% attack on the blockchain. You know, the whole point of Tor is you're going through a lot of other people's servers, but if somebody could actually control a significant percentage of those servers, they could totally undo the whole value of Tor. And this is the first uh, uh, attacker other than the US military that I've heard with that capability. And they don't seem to have any information on who the threat actor is, but the fact that they're stealing cryptocurrency would make me should think it's probably North Koreans, but I don't really know. But anyway, it's, uh, it's probably still going on. That's why one thing uh, all students and anybody in the field should know, don't trust Tor too much. Tor is not really hiding you as much as you might think. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. And Liz has got Salesforce. So I thought this article was kind of interesting. I stumbled across it yesterday. Um, and it's about how uh, big com tech companies like Salesforce and Google and Facebook, um, well, I mean, the title is that they undermine the public health system. Um, I'm not sure if I go that far, but the, it brings up some interesting uh, points to consider. Um, and essentially the premise of this article is that, especially during the pandemic, but even before then, all of these large tech companies um, have been uh, getting some pretty interesting contracts with the state. And some of them are, um, some of them are no bid contracts, which is something that I have an issue with. Um, and what that means is essentially that uh, when a company, when a company or a person gets a no bid contract, nobody else has a chance to uh, bid on those jobs. There's not a there's not a, a public RFP that gets put out. It's just it goes to one um, entity. Uh, and, and oftentimes these are massive contracts like millions and millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's not like it's really small potatoes. And um, I think that in some cases they can, these, the efforts of these companies can be helpful. But in other cases, I think they're definitely not. I think they're taking advantage of public money. And a lot of the time, the officials who are making the decisions on who to hire for this stuff um, don't really have a good technical grasp of the requirements for the project or the capabilities of the entity that gets the no bid contract or um, a whole lot of things. So, um, so uh, very often what, what will the outcome of this will be that the state spends millions and millions of dollars for, for nothing or for something that doesn't work very well. Now, the other side of the argument is that all this stuff should be done um, in house by the states. I don't really think that's feasible either, because um, one, you know, some of the some of the examples in this article were stuff that needed to be um, stood up very quickly. Uh, so in response to the pandemic, and so I think in in certain cases you got to outsource stuff. You have to. You can't. You just, there's just no way. Um, you can move in the state bureaucracy fast enough and you just don't have the expertise needed to um, accomplish your, your objective. So sometimes you've got to outsource and hire these companies. Other times it doesn't work out so well and it really makes you wonder, you know, who's, who's getting paid off <laughs> to, to offer the no bid contracts because we have a long and rich history of that. So um, just an interesting, interesting point to consider and with the way that uh, these government contracts, especially health related ones, um, relate to um, state money. 
And, you know, one of the, one of the big issues here is that, especially with companies like Facebook, they have a long and proven track record of doing just dastardly evil, horrible things so that when they actually try, do try to do something good, nobody trusts them. And it's sort of understandable. <laughs> Yeah, and I can see the corruption. I mean, you see Google giving $10 million to Newsom's campaign, which right. is uh, the same thing we've had all along. I remember when Microsoft got sued, that was what Bill Gates said. The lesson I learned is you have to donate to political campaigns or right. the government will hurt you. So uh, it's this is like Bernie Sanders has been saying this. Reforming the effect of money on politics is yep. the root cause of a lot of this. Of course, another root cause is the failure to enforce antitrust laws. So we have like these two or three huge companies that are so powerful that there's no point even hiring anybody else because only that giant could really do it. Right, and you know, the other beef that people have with this, and I, I get it, I kind of, I, I can definitely identify with this is that uh, with all the money that is being funneled into these corporations, um, our actual state public health system is still pretty defunded in a lot of areas. It's, you know, it's, I think that here in the Bay Area, it's pretty good overall, but especially once we get out into um, some of the more rural counties, because it's all county by county, our public health system in California. Once we get out into some of the counties that aren't like in the LA or the um, SF metro areas, it's a major problem. But even here, um, we're still struggling. And people are like, how are you going to pay $600 million to a uh, big Acme large tech comp enterprise and you're not going to fund the um, actual you know, programs that are making a difference at the community level. I think that's a legit criticism. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy issue to solve, but it is, um, I think, something that folks should be aware of. Yep. Well, you know, supposedly Warren and Klobuchar are going to go after those big companies, and that'll rock the boat if they really do it. Yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Again, the effects of money in politics. I'm not. I'm not optimistic. Yeah, I'm not either. Hey, Urban's got Windows 10X. Uh, well, uh, actually, Microsoft will not launch Windows 10X. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're going to focus on updating all their icons and making things look uh, 2021. Windows 10X was going to be. A smaller version of Windows, right? Correct. It was supposed to be the rival or the answer to Chrome OS. But the whole po the benefit of Chrome OS is you don't have any malware, and I mean, Windows could not provide that. Well, so that was the idea: is is to build something to rival Chrome OS. Yeah. On cheaper hardware, but it looks like they are going to focus instead on doing updates to Windows itself, Windows Ten like updating uh, icons that have been around since 95 and doing other other things like that before they go back to uh, fighting back uh, against Chrome Chrome OS. Are Chrome's, is Chrome OS a significant market segment anymore? Is, is Chrome still hot? I mean, it's definitely uh, booming with the schools. Okay, I just wondered. Cause I remember netbooks came and went and uh, the combination tablets, laptops kind of came and went. There's this this small computing device seems to be a pretty short lived market. Uh, it's been successful. Chrome OS's market share has been increasing. Okay, well maybe the Chrome OS has a good solution. Another area that everyone has been expecting to make a pile of money out is wearables, and I don't think any of those have really caught on yet. I don't see anybody wearing an Apple Watch. Really, I see a lot of people wearing Apple Watches. Okay, so maybe Apple's finally got one that works there. Go figure. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Wait, who has an Apple Watch? I've never, I don't see those anywhere. I saw them around last week, last weekend when I was out and about. Well, you I know, see. to be fair, I'm not going out and seeing people much. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people wearing Apple Watches. Yeah. Okay. Well, those and Fitbits are the two that I've seen the most. Okay. Well, anyway, then Caitlin's got X Code Ghost, which I remember hearing about. Yep. So, um, there was a modified version, oh, sorry, I should say 9to5Mac has an article here about 
Xcode Ghost. Uh, so in 2015, um, there was a modified version of Xcode that got sent out to a bunch of developers. And much like the Solar Winds hack, um, it injected malware into the compiled codes uh, that legit developers were, were developing. And that code eventually made its way, or sorry, the, the product, the compiled product, made its way onto the App Store. And recently, uh, some emails acquired from Apple uh, shows that uh, there are about 128 million customers uh, downloaded 2,500 apps that were infected by this malware. Um, so that is, yeah, a lot of people who downloaded malware from the Apple Store. But what did the malware do? That's a good question. I have no idea. Well, I read uh, the article and they said all it did was steal, you know, not terribly sensitive information. It was pretty easy to get anyway. And that's why Apple didn't bother to tell people. And right. I didn't hear about the Xcode ghost, but we didn't hear about the number of affected people at the time. Yeah. And apparently also uh, Angry Birds 2 was infected. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's something I think a lot of us have, have put on our phones. So. Oh, yeah. 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 Anyway, the app, people are trying to say Apple was remiss and not telling everybody about it, but but it's not that clear that it was really important enough to tell everybody. Anyway, it's another supply chain attack, which uh, we're all trying to figure out how to deal with. Supply chain and ransomware are big areas where we don't seem to have much in the way of a good defense. And Alan's got this catch me if you can copy. It's pretty hilarious. Yeah, the catch me if you can, the movie that was released in 2002, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Ted Hanks, and uh, Jennifer Garner uh, is the, some, the somewhat embellished uh, story of a Frank Abagnale who claims that in his uh, early uh, adult life, he was a, a con man and a very successful one. He posed as a doctor, an airline pilot, a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. There is a book that has just been published that debunks all these claims and um, says that he was actually in prison between the ages of 16 and 20 during this time that he supposedly was a con man. And so it may in fact be that this, the, the con that he pulled is the story of his life. He never did any of these things, aside from pretending to be a TWA pilot for a couple of weeks, but not actually getting very far with that, just ingratiating himself with the family of a TWA flight attendant. And this oh, is actually not news. Yeah. Back in 1978, the San Francisco Chronicle published an article on the front page saying that Abagnale made up all these stories. But in the pre-internet era, I guess these stories were promptly forgotten. And so everybody just accepted Frank Abag Abagnale's story and the movie um, because it was just too good. The story was too good. And uh, it's only un it hasn't been until now that uh, these stories are being comprehensively debunked in this book. So people are beginning to suspect that all these social engineers are actually lying to us. Apparently so. You know, this is one situation where uh, uh, fiction is stranger than truth, and it's certainly a lot less uh, truthful. Well, you know, the whole Kevin Mitnick also brought out the whole field of social engineering, and um, and again with a bunch of stories that you can't verify. It's um. It is, it does show something about human psychology that we all accept their stories of all these hacks and make the whole field of social engineering. And, it, and many people, including me, I think never stop to think that maybe they're lying about this having reformed and telling their stories. Absolutely. And after reading about Frank Abagnale, I, I, the first person I thought of was Mitnick. Yeah. I mean, he wrote and, his books with great interest, and I believed them all. And now I realize why in the hell did I believe them? I mean, I don't have no specific information that he's yeah. lying, but in retrospect, I should have just assumed he was lying until proven otherwise. Obviously. Yeah, and Mitnick, like Abagnale, has some great stories. Yeah, and Abagnale, like Mitnick, has his own security firm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, not cybersecurity so much, but fraud prevention, and uh, apparently. Uh, security and, and fraud prevention are great fields to be in if you're a con man. No, I remember a decade ago when I started dealing directly with cyber criminals, they all brag so much. They all claim to have all these technical chops and all these great accomplishments. 
and it's very unlikely that it's any of it's true. It just seems to be uh, the tradition. But it's great marketing. It's, I guess it is, yeah. Anyway, then I thought this was awesome. Um, they have a tidal turbine in Scotland and I wondered how this worked. And this seems to me like a really awesome thing. They, they just have this thing that is basically a boat and they go stick it not very far offshore. It looks like about half a mile offshore and they just put two anchors down and then they just have a turbine like the propeller. And as the tide comes in, it turns the propeller. And then when the tide's going out, they turn it around. So it turns it again. And apparently this makes a lot of power. So um, it, it sounds great. This sounds to me like an awesome way, like better than windmills really, of entirely predictable, uh, easy, relatively inexpensive, relatively low tech power. It this sounds like a great cool. idea. I always wondered why that we didn't have any kind of hydroelectric, um, you know, we dam rivers for it, but I always wondered why we didn't harness the energy of the tide. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. And I wonder if you have someone to harness the waves. But anyway, this seems like a great idea. And then, of course, the only question is doing the, uh, the math. Does this really uh, generate enough power to make up for the cost of manufacturing the stuff and maintaining it? But uh, it might because windmills totally do. Remember that big tragedy in Texas that came out that like 10 or 20 percent of the grid is now windmills, which I had no idea. So um, I'm glad to see these. Uh, apparently green solutions come out. Anyway, and the last one, oh, well, Liz has DOD, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, I thought this story was pretty cool. So um, a few years ago, <coughs> the Pentagon um, started inviting folks to um, look for vulnerabilities in their systems as part of their Hack the Pentagon um, event. Yeah, I was one of them. Like, all you had to do was apply and then they would approve you. Then I didn't find anything because it was all .NET Nuke. And I'm like, what the hell is .NET Nuke? But anyway. <laughs> well, it's cool because they, uh, as you saw, they only had a very limited number of um, targets that were approved. But now they've opened up that, they've opened that up to every public facing system, which I think is uh, really smart because um, they, you know, you really, you really want to know about the holes in these systems um, when somebody's excited to report it to you versus when you find out about it during an incident slash crisis. So um, I thought this was really cool that they expanded their uh, program. Yeah, I'm really glad to see this. And this, I think, is hugely influential. I think when the military does it, then all the corporations and everybody accept that it's OK to do, whereas, you know, Five years ago, most companies would never touch this and thought you were insane to suggest it. Right, um, and and I think too, you know, they're making strides in the right direction. The fact that uh, they even have the DoD even has a uh, cyber crime center is uh, an improvement over the past few years, and the fact that they're actually overseeing this and a, and a responsible vulnerability disclosure program is great. You really don't want to shoot the messenger. Uh, when people are trying to come to you and tell you, hey, there are holes here that uh, a threat actor could exploit, maybe you want to patch this up. And uh, in the old days, that's what had happened. If you found a hole like that and tried to report it, they'd come down on you like a ton of bricks. But uh, yeah, good to see they're making a shift in the right direction. Yeah, that's a good thing. All right, and that's it. We will be back on Friday.